Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Someone asked me yesterday um, how I felt about the draft lottery for Detroit. And I told them, you know, I don't mathematically, it's not going to go great, but that's the math. And they're like, no, no, no. But what's your gut feeling? And I was like, I'm trying to avoid gut feelings. It's hurt me before. But they're like, okay, but come on. Like, this is the, the most important thing that's going to happen to you guys until October. Like, you must have like a gut feeling. And quite honestly, I've been trying to avoid thoughts about the draft other than like when we we're just talking on the, the pod because I was like, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to stress myself out about this. It's stupid. We already know what's going to happen. So I thought, I thought, I thought, it was like late last night and I was like, man, I just, I have a good vibe about this. Like I'm getting some like good omens. Like I feel good about it. I actually, for the first time since Detroit has been remotely relevant to the draft lottery, which has been most of this podcast existence. Um, I was like, I think, I think there's a chance they could win. And I was like heading to bed and I let the dog out. And then I was like, I'm standing there and I'm like, I actually have like a good feeling in my gut that they're going to win. And I let the dog in and the dog smelled like shit because she had rolled in uh, another animal's poop. And that was the universe telling me to get back in my place. And I was stupid forever having hope. So um, my gut feeling is setting the bar as low as possible right it's, now. It's so weird that you also had that, that you had that feeling because I also had that feeling, but it was thinking about how I had that feeling in the Phillips Zadina draft. And I said we were going to draft Zadina. And I'm pretty sure that was recorded on the podcast. And then it happened. Yeah. So if anything about Scientology has taught me anything, <laughs> I believe you. So hold on. What are you saying right now? Who are we going to draft, Evan? Philip Zadina. <laughs> you know what would be great? Two Philip Zadinas. Honestly, can't argue with that. It's fantastic logic. We are a day, two days away from the NHL draft lottery. Actually, as, at the time of recording this, just under two days away from the NHL draft lottery. We are not remotely mentally prepared for this. No, it's it still feels like it's eight months away, but it's really two two days away. Me, me and you have very different definitions of the word prepared. I am very mentally prepared uh, for this draft lottery because today, throughout most of the day, I have just been so blindingly angry about everything. I'm in the exact right mind space for what I'm going to need Friday night. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Very clearly doing okay. I'm Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad. I'm Evan. Yeah, it's funny. You know, uh, Friday basically determines if I'm going to be happy for the next X number of months until the draft or... Uh, just forgetting about hockey for X number of months before the draft, because when we inevitably draft fourth, I'll basically just tune out until uh, until draft night. That's okay. what's at stake here. If the Red Wings win any one of the top three picks, or I don't know what Evan's threshold here, but I'll, I'll guess like any one of the top two picks, we not only get one of those top two picks, we also get a more engaged Evan Yes, up until October. So I'm just saying, universe... An engaged Evan makes for a better winged wheel pod. Do, do you want my glass half full perspective of this stupid draft lottery system? Yeah, sure. Okay. So this global pandemic, which is another great omen for how things are going or going to go, um, has left us a very large window between draft lottery and draft to overanalyze the hell out of everything. So if we win the draft lottery and pick first overall... Uh, pro, we draft Alexi Lafreniere. Con, not a whole hell of a lot to analyze for the next few months. If we pick anywhere but first. Uh, con, we don't get Alexi Lafreniere. Pro, we have an absolute ton of content for the next few months overanalyzing everybody ranked in the top 10. See, that's where I'm going to disagree with you because, I, you know, we've had people... 
it's mostly people on YouTube. People on YouTube hate watch a lot. And it's just always so funny to me because I'm like, I wish you wouldn't for your sake. Like, I really think this best for you to not do this. We're not worth this this hit to your mental health. You're very clearly angry at us. No one's forcing you to. Anyways, uh, one of them has said on multiple occasions, you guys want the Red Wings to lose the draft lottery just so you'll have more content. And let me make this clear right now. No. <laughs> <laughs> very much no. So much no. Um I can't believe we actually have to say that because if you're going to hate watch us, the, li- the least you could do is uh, listen to our words. Um, I know it's a little bit difficult considering how ugly two thirds of us are, but still um, you, you can't think that there's any bigger boost to this organization than drafting Alexi Lafreniere. Look at what happened to the Toronto Maple Leafs from the moment they drafted Austin Matthews. It has been a straight upwards trajectory. Uh, and that is what could possibly or probably happen for the Red Wings. And Brad, I actually think that we can make the most out of the content um, if there's no longer a debate for the, the first round pick because of where they're drafting. And that's because of the pandemic, because the pandemic has trained us to look more intently at second and third and fourth round picks. So we're going to drum up this world of content regardless. And those second round picks are still relevant. I think we'll be okay it's is it as are those second round picks as exciting to debate as you know Byfield versus Stutzla versus Raymond versus Rossi versus who's going to be available where and you know uh, does Drysdale even get a look? No, of course not. But you get to precede all of those conversations about the second round picks with just a general like five minute like glee about the fact that the Red Wings are going to draft Alexi Lafreniere and that balances out. Not picking first overall gives us more content for the next three months. Not no, like picking first overall doesn't give us no content for the next three months, just less. Um, But picking first overall gives us more content for the next 10 years. Yeah. If, if the, if the hockey gods descended and said to us three, we will give the Red Wings the first overall pick, but you must not speak on this podcast until the draft. I'd pack away the mics right then and there. See you guys in October. <laughs> like, yep. It's it's going to be a stressful day. So, um, you for those who may not have heard, we are going to do our annual live stream. We'll post a link. It's going to be up on YouTube in the future. We are going to do that in other places, but for now, just to keep it simple, because of the uh, hashtag these trying times, it's a little bit more difficult to run a live stream off of a video call it's a little bit more tech intensive and our computers tend to not like it so uh it'll be up on youtube we'll put a link out on all of our socials um we're gonna start it early so probably around seven eastern and the the lottery is at eight eastern from what i've heard the lottery is going to take 30 minutes that's not drawing it out really and of all of the years where the NHL has drawn this process out and just made it a huge pain in the ass to watch when they should have made it more concise, this is their first year where they had a license to do that. Draw it out this time, make a whole production of it, give people something to watch hockey related, and then go back to making it concise in other years. But no, they are they just can't help themselves. Now. From a marketing standpoint, uh, the NHL is very stupid to not draw this out, but they had their huge window to get the entire world's eyes on them, and they missed it, so they've made their bet, and now they can lay in it. I'm happy they're screwing this up because I can't. I couldn't take another more 30 minutes of this. I hate this. I've, I've been on record as saying I hate this draft lottery system. I hate this year's specific draft lottery format even more than the normal stupid way. I hate that they missed an opportunity to get views. And I hate the fact that I know I'm probably, I have a 51% chance of feeling ripped off on Friday. Probably more than that, actually, because if we don't get a top two, (laughs) but yeah, no, I'm, mm, yeah, preemptively angry. That's why it's my name on here. Cause I, there's, there's nothing exciting about this to me from the sense that if we get first overall, my air quotation expectation for being the worst team has been met. Nothing can exceed my expectations on Friday night. I'm either okay, good, and I'm happy, and it's great, but it's expectation. Anything below that feels like, oh, yeah, we just won 17 games in 70 fucking games for nothing. (laughs) 
not for nothing. Obviously, this is a the glass half full is this is probably the best year to have a guaranteed top four pick. But man, is 17 wins in 70 games, and there's a chance we pick fourth. I still can't wrap my head around how that's a good system. So let's let's review the system. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go over how this draft lottery is gonna work. Uh, we're gonna go over specific percentages. We're gonna talk about what happens if a placeholder team uh, wins it, um, and then dive into our opinions on that. Only a small recap because we have talked about it ad nauseum on previous episodes. So uh, the NHL after a lot of debate and back and forth to the extreme, uh, has decided to keep its 15-team draft lottery. And you might be saying, well, won't that include teams who are getting a shot at the Stanley Cup? The answer is stupidly yes. To not dwell on that any further, let's move on. Uh, So the seven teams that are um, in the draft lottery, um, or I mean six, really, seven teams represented, um, those are Detroit, Ottawa, San Jose, but Ottawa owns their pick, Los Angeles, Anaheim, New Jersey, and Buffalo. Everyone else is a placeholder team. So the uh, rest of the teams will be, I think, named placeholder team, like A through H. Is that it? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yeah. Um, I know my alphabet. And those placeholder teams have odds to win the top three pick as well. So um what's going to happen is it's going to be the same kind of lottery as previous years where they are going to draw three times uh they're going to draw for pick three they're going to draw for pick two and they're going to draw for pick one any one of those teams can uh win it and move straight up to to the top there's no limit to how high you can move up so um if it's the three teams that win those three picks are all teams that are identified so anyone from detroit all the way down to buffalo those seven worst teams in the league then there isn't a second lottery. We know how this is going to go down, and the order is the order. Now, there are these placeholder teams or qualifier teams or whatever you want to call them. They have a cumulative, like, 24 or, like, I don't know, like 30-ish percent chance of winning the first pick. And they also have odds at the second pick, and they also have odds at the third pick. So, in reality, we're looking at a very good shot here that one of these eight unidentified teams is going to win one of the top three spots at which point there's going to be a second draft lottery after the losers of the play-in round are identified and they all get an equal shot at the placeholder picks that one picks one to one through three and if it's one of them then they all get an equal shot at one if it's two of them then they all then they're going to do that same lottery for two of them it's I can't saying it out loud. It's such a stupid system. It is unbelievably stupid. The the NHL had a free pass this year to finally do a proper draft lottery where it would be just the bottom seven teams make the odds whatever the hell you want. But the bottom seven teams, the teams that truly need the help. And let me emphasize the word need. If the Pittsburgh Penguins lose and they're playing, they don't need any help. That's just a fluke. If the Columbus Blue Jackets lose, they're still a good team. They don't need the help. Ottawa, Detroit, uh, New Jersey, Anaheim, they all desperately need help. They are in a bad way uh, going forward. But no, God God forbid we give these teams. My gut's telling me two of the placeholder teams are going to get a draft lottery because the NHL is going to be loving having to do a second draft lottery while we sit there in misery as we watch teams that get to enjoy playoff hockey and then draft lottery rewards. It's again, in a normal year, the current draft lottery system is bad and stupid and encourages tanking for longer out of necessity. And then now you're allowing good teams, legitimately good teams that could have a bad week to (laughs) alter the course of their franchise for the next 10 years in the positive direction. Like, I can't wrap my head around the fact that we live in a world where the Pittsburgh Penguins or Edmonton Oilers or Toronto Maple Leafs could get Alexi Lafreniere. I know we've ranted about this for hours on end about the podcast on this podcast over the last month, but I still can't actually believe it's possible. And I want all my thoughts on the record here, because even if 
one, two, three goes Detroit, Ottawa, Ottawa, as the standings showed. I'm, I still hate this system. Even if Detroit wins, obviously I'm going to be happy. I'm still going to hate this system. Cause there's going to be confirmation bias too. As soon as if, if that is the order, they'll be like, look, it works. It works. <laughs> Nothing yeah. will change. And that's why I'm getting all this on the record today because i don't know the order i don't know how it turns out so everything i say is with legitimately no bias today because i don't know the red wings can still get alexi lafreniere i'll be happy as hell i i'll still hate this system and it's the the nhl was okay the pandemic sucks and they're losing a lot of money but the nhl was gifted the opportunity to be front and center in the in the eyes of the world for like a full month and they missed it. And then they had the opportunity to balance out the competitiveness in the NHL. And they missed it. And then they had the opportunity to at least make a spectacle of it. And they missed it. It is staggering in these air quote hashtag trying times. How the NHL only made it worse for themselves over and over and over over again just to appease the like three teams that are in the play and that probably had legitimately more concern with the draft lottery just it's stupid so the odds for detroit boil down as follows uh their chance at first overall is 18 and a half percent now at from a single spot the worst team in the league last year by a healthy margin their win percentage was 0.275 the next worst team had a um, 0.437 that was the Ottawa Senators so that's how much worse Detroit was Um, they have an 18 and a half percent chance uh, 18 and a half percent chance at number one overall single or single best odds from one pick but they do have the second best odds at first overall and I'll get to that in a second their chances at uh, second overall are 16 and a half percent and their chances at third overall, which is their least likely likely pick, is 14.4%. Their highest probability is fourth overall, and that's also the lowest they can go, and that is a whopping 50.6%, 50.6% chance. So that is greater than a coin toss percent chance that they are going to land fourth. That is why, mathematically, Friday night is going to be hurtful (laughs) um the other teams are the next two teams down the list are ottawa and san jose their chance at first overall are 13 and a half percent and 11 and a half percent respectively the thing is ottawa owns san jose's pick from the eric carlson trade whoops so that is a 25 percent chance for ottawa to get the first overall pick um, which means that detroit is bumped down to the second most likely team uh, in the draft lottery to win it LA has an a nine and a half percent chance, Anaheim eight and a half percent, New Jersey seven and a half percent, Buffalo six and a half percent. And then the placeholder teams have in order six, five, three and a half, three, two and a half, two, one and a half, and one percent chance at winning first overall. Six percent. Why that are those not wild? Why are those the odds on those picks not uniform? Like that's just stupid. That team has it's all getting random to get if one of them wins it. Yeah, it, like just make them all like a two percent or whatever that averages out to. Like Jesus, Even but it they, doesn't matter. And if it, it doesn't matter, I get it. It just seems stupid overkill. Those like in reality, it is what Brad just said, where they're gonna average those out in like the placeholder balls. Or if it, they're still doing lottery balls, are gonna just reflect that. Mathematically, it makes no difference because they're not assigned to teams, and then they have a second lottery. In their second lottery, all eight teams have a twelve and a half percent chance. Um, which is an even across the board at winning each of the hypothetical one through three picks that they win. Now, if they don't win any of the first three picks, um, then they don't have a second lottery that's just done in inverse order of points percentage, but that's a whole different thing. Oh, yeah, because the NHL is going to let that happen. Conspiracy yeah, theory, real. tinfoil hat on. So uh, you may have noticed the lowest or the most you can get bumped down is three picks and the most you can move up is unlimited because the world is unfair. So, uh, Ottawa owns the second and third most, uh, second and third highest probability at first overall, which means they can be their worst probability here is picks five and six. 
Um, based on some of the draft rankings we saw, Ottawa can make out like bandits at this draft. They should make out like bandits at this draft. Any yeah. combination uh, that they get is very, very good for the future of their franchise. They haven't been the best or worst drafting team, though, so that uh, they could go a few ways. This draft class is kind of uh, taking that out of their hands, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You saw Bob McKenzie's draft rankings. There is a mm, <laughs> there's a good chunk of the NHL that still doesn't get it, according to those draft rankings, so you never know. So, again, just to recap, if you're a Red Wings fan, what you should expect on Friday is a good time watching our live stream, some solidarity, solidarity with fellow fans. Do not, and I repeat, do not get your hopes up. Our hopes are through the floor, and it is still going to hurt tomorrow. Mathematically, this isn't going to go great. Anything better than that is a tacit victory in my mind. And before, I, I actually used to say third and fourth are the same for me. Um, but after seeing some draft rankings, kind of not anymore. Um, well, <laughs> the draft rankings made me feel a little better about beating the drum for that. Uh, there's a bigger gap between one and two than there is two in the field. Mm -hmm. Because that takes on a whole different meaning now. Yeah. Uh, we got a question on last episode, and I can't remember who asked it, where they said, how likely is it that Byfield falls to four? And I, we were like, mm, less than 1%. I would still hold to that, but yeah. But Byfield falling to three is now like 50-50. There, you're going to find rankings everywhere, and you're going to find rankings that you like, and you're going to find you know scouts that you like, and you're going to find resources that you like and trust more than others um, and that's great but at the end of the day the best idea that we have available to us about what's going to happen on draft day is bob mckenzie's rankings and that's not because he's telling us what's going to happen in his mind um, or, or how he thinks these players are going to perform he pulls scouts and front office executives and gms and and you know people in the know from these organizations so he's not telling us player performance or their aptitude or anything like that he's telling you how other teams value them he gets so he, he gets 10 people from nhl organizations to give them their his give him their draft list so we have an idea of what one third of the nhl is thinking so obviously that's only one third that means the other two thirds could think all these people are dumb but it's if you look historically at McKenzie's draft rankings versus the actual draft order, he doesn't have a hell of a lot of variance in his thing. There's usually only one or two outliers every year. And other than that, he's he's within a few picks almost religiously. He's so consistent with it. So old Bobo's list this year, number one, no surprise, Alexi Lafreniere. Number two, Tim Stutzla. The first curveball comes quickly. And that's so this gives me hope, and then the further down the list we go, the less hope I have for the NHL transitioning to the mindset that I think myself and most hockey fans think the NHL should have right now. Because we've had the Stutzla versus Byfield debate where right now Stutzla is the better player. They are very different players where Stutzla is the the crafty, creative, super skill guy. Byfield's the simple but effective and physically imposing and fast you know just simple game but he makes it work so the fact that nhl scouts are starting to lean towards the creative player makes me happy not that i necessarily agree like i i'm still having a hard time putting stutz ahead of byfield just because byfield is still so raw and has so much room to grow that he's riskier than stutz i would argue but mm. It's it's hard, but it, the mindset is what makes me happy there. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's really no um, angry argument to be had here. I also agree that I, I would take Byfield at two. And if the Red Wings drafted third and got Byfield, I would feel like we won the closest thing you can possibly get to Alexi Lafreniere in that. And that's not a knock on Tim Stutzla. I also love Tim Stutzla. If they got him at three or four, I would also be thrilled. Um, but the the... The second pick is now going to be either this centerman who has these unreal skills and the team is taking a real swing, uh, swing at the ball and they're they're shooting for the moon and they're taking a high risk with an astronomical reward, or they're taking an extremely skilled, uh, fast, 
uh, player from a, a generally unscouted league or a league that's still kind of coming into the know now. And, and we only really start to see that emerge with last year's pick of Mort Sider um, when, when Eisenman took him sixth overall. And then this is a guy who kind of came onto the scene late in terms of top rankings, um, All also could be a centerman. So there's some risk, risk there. Is his ceiling as high uh, as Byfield in my mind? No, I don't think so. But it's also not so clear cut where I would be angry one way or the not one way or another. Um, but you're no longer getting the like I'm trying to find like a prototypical pick without just slamming a player for no reason. Well, uh, the problem with these two is uh, I, I can't because I, I want to compare Byfield to Stutzla, but I I can't. They're dramatically different players playing in dramatically different leagues and mm -hmm. with dramatically different physical features. It is super hard to figure out because I like we've talked about. Um, by field at length and like i said i've personally been I, I know not everybody shares this opinion with me but i've personally been sharing concerns for about six months about byfield's uh hockey sense like is it at that elite level like it's good nobody can deny it's good but is it like that way stutzla i don't have that question i know he has it but he also doesn't have byfield size strength shot um but Stutzla has the hands, the hockey sense. The speed is better than Byfield's, but he's six one versus six four, and he's like one hundred and eighty pounds versus you know what's going to probably end up being like two thirty, two forty. Yeah, and I, I try to find a comparison player for Stutzla in the NHL. I can't really think of a good one. I try to find a good comparison for Byfield in the NHL. I can't really find one. It's like I can look at a guy like Lucas Raymond and go, yeah, that's. That's a Mitch Marner prototype there. I can look at a Jamie Drysdale and go, oh, yeah, I can, that's a, a poor man's Kale McCarr right there or something like that, right? Uh, but I, I don't even like calling Byfield a poor man's Malkin. Like, the physical traits are the same, but I don't think the brain is on the same level. Um, oh, Malkin has, like, a near generational sense for the game. Yeah, e exactly. So it's... Not top hundred player though. So. Not top yeah, hundred. Not a top hundred. No Duncan Keith. So it it's going to be fascinating. And and again, as I talked about when I released my draft, my my first version of my draft rankings, man, like I flirted with Stutzla anywhere from two to four. It's it's going to be fascinating because again, I very much want Detroit to win the draft lottery. But if they don't, man, we are going to have a lot of fun conversations about figuring out what the hell is going on and, and how do you even properly rank these guys? Yeah. It's not many years where you see, um, not only the top player be so clear cut, but then two through like 10 be so interchangeable. And we always joke that two through 10 are interchangeable because we never know what teams are going to do on draft day. But like, we're talking about rankings, which generally come to a consensus the closer you get to the draft um it doesn't matter who you're looking at people just generally kind of converge on a, a few single points um you have tim stutzel ranked second within like the nhl organizations as we see reflected in, in bob mckenzie's rankings you have him ranked third by a lot of people i think we'd probably have him falling in three i think he's still there on your list brad and then you have him like ranked eight or ninth on some lists and it's like that's it, it's that's not to to say someone's right and someone's not and, and don't trust these guys and, and trust this scouting service. No, I'm talking about if you're drafting anywhere from two through 10, you're getting a quality player. Like this is a quality, quality batch. This is the best top end of a draft pre-draft. I mean, this could end up being a complete dud draft like any other one um, that I've seen in some time. And, and that's why if you want some good news, if and when things don't go great for Detroit tomorrow, or not tomorrow, I keep saying tomorrow. What day? Well, people are probably listening to this tomorrow, which yeah. <laughs> it is tomorrow for them, Ryan. It's fine. You Coming can go to you from it. the future. Whoa, Brad is old. It's the same <laughs> as the present. Hey, I'm Ryan. You're the only one here under the age of 30. Um, oh, just <laughs> Evan and I were cracking up pre show. Brad out of nowhere goes, um, Oh, by the way, I've uh, on Twitter I've muted all mentions of trebuchets, tree buckets. <laughs> it's been such a pleasant timeline ever since. Listener suppression. Yeah, I just want to keep you guys apprised, so you're going to have to become a little bit more creative. For the right amount of money, I'll give you a PO box um, that you can mail stuff to, and then I'll per periodically drop it off at Brad's house. 
I could, hey, physical items would be great because I could just see the return address and set it on fire before I open it. Well, not if they're 300 meters away and they're firing a projectile from a trebuchet, Brad. That's true. That would be, that would be impressive, that level of accuracy. No, but seriously, it, like, there is a reality here. Where, let's, I'm just going to go back to, to Bob's rankings here. I'm going to read them out for you. Hold on, hold on. One thing uh, when we're talking about this, because uh, one thing Bob made very clear, too, was there is a top three. He he said that there these three have separated from the group, and I will not stand for this Lucas Raymond disrespect. Quite frankly, it's appalling. I'm appalled. Would you? There's no way Lucas Raymond would be taken over Stutzler or Byfield. I I doubt it. But again, remember the top three of Matthews, Line A, Pulley, Yarvi. It didn't happen. So I, you can never say never. Seth Jones was a uh, fifty-fifty for first overall with the one year and went fourth so weirder crazier things have happened but bob was pretty certain that there's a top three here and hell lucas raymond wasn't even fourth or fifth on his list which was deeply concerning and upsetting to me but that's okay that's just my opinion the things brad cares about in his day are so funny to figure out (laughs) so much different i'm just angry about everything today so i'm i'm honestly just looking for excuses just wait till we cover how many one dimensional defensive defenseman made the top 62 on his board. It's horrifying. I'm going to read the top 12 because I think any one of these top 12 in some universe could be taken fourth overall. Um, I don't think you're, it's very likely for a lot of them, but I think there's a world where it could happen. So in order on McKenzie's final draft rankings, Alexi Lafreniere, Tim Stutzla, second overall, Quinton Byfield, third overall. Jamie Drysdale, fourth overall. Fifth is Cole Perfetti. Sixth is Lucas Raymond. Seventh is Marco Rossi. Eighth is Jake Sanderson. Number nine, Alex Holtz. Ten, Jack Quinn. Eleven, Yaroslav Askarov. Twelve, Anton Lindell. Uh, Jake Sanderson is eighth. <laughs> Now again, I uh, what's that old saying about throwing stones in glass houses because the Red Wings were the team to reach for a defensive defenseman, but at the same time it turned out Mo Sider had a lot more offense that we didn't realize he had. And Jake Sanderson very well might. He did come on offensively towards the end of the year. I think there's probably no draft prospect who who was hurt more than the season ending as early as it did because he did start to show a whole new dimension to his game or it was just a really good month and then he could have come back down to earth. It's a draft. We don't know. It's a guessing game. That's the fun of it. But still, I mean, there wasn't a lot there. You have Braden Schneider and Caden Gooley in the top 20. You have, oh, it's just, it, it frustrates me because the NHL is moving away from this. And yet a lot of teams don't seem to get it. And it's it's confusing. So Max messaged me and, and asking about Sanderson and what my take was. And honestly, I'm not surprised about Sanderson. I think I've said it on a previous episode that this was going to happen with him. Every year, defensemen rise dramatically. It's a hard position for teams to fill because I think the amount of top-end defensive talent in the NHL right now is scarce. And I, I also think... Um, the way defensemen develop makes it even more difficult to predict who's going to be good. And so teams swing and miss a lot more. Um, that meaning pl- defensemen take a good amount of seasons before maturing. So defensemen could suck, could suck, could suck, could suck. Oh, bam, all of a sudden they're a top defenseman. You want a case in point? Victor Hedman was on the trading block for like pennies on the dollar one year not for actual pennies he didn't get traded so that's silly to say but he was on the trading block and what was being proposed or offered was like a one millionth of what it would take to get him now seth jones wasn't always highly regarded because you know defensemen don't get the grace of having a slow start but that's what they need regardless defense uh, hold on could you tell that to jeff blashill and just put cc dennis chalowski yeah i was i was gonna circle back to that just just my little aside while I'm angry about everything today. Defensemen rise dramatically before the draft. There are always defensemen who are slightly undervalued, like slightly undervalued, who get a, a longer look and teams are like, oh, no, this guy should be higher. And then they just rocket him up. And I think that's what Jake Sanderson is here. Uh, you know who he reminds me of? And this is maybe calling too far back. Calvin DeHaan. 
I think Calvin DeHaan is a fine defenseman. I think when he was drafted, it was a good pick. Um, he was drafted much higher than I thought he would go, but the team took a reach for him and, and they swung. And it, he, Jake Sanderson is a extremely, extremely talented skater, an extremely apt uh, defenseman in his own zone, which I think should be the first tenet of being a good defenseman. Um, great gap control, very smart. Um, not bad offensively, but just not a lot there offensively, which is why when people compare him or say maybe Sanderson should be taken over Drysdale, I'm like, eh, Drysdale has so much more room to grow offensively, and he's already such a great offensive talent from the blue line. Jake Sanderson hasn't quite shown that. Could he have more potential that we haven't seen yet? Of course. Of course. You don't draft someone where he's talking about where you're talking about drafting him without that being a chance. Or at least that's what you would hope. And then that's what we had to cling to when Eisman went up to the podium and drafted more at Cider six overall. Um, and that's kind of what came through so far. We haven't seen what more Mart Sider can do offensively in the NHL. I'm not saying it's going to like not pan out, but f- by all rights, he does have more of an offensive game than he maybe got credit for. But still, the major, major, major aspect of his game was his defensive ability. And I think that's the same for Sanderson here. Not identical to Mort Sider, obviously, but still. Um, I don't value Jake Sanderson so high as eighth like he is in this list, but I think if a team took him eighth, go for it, man. Like... He's going to eat minutes. He's going to do it well. He's going to make some coach happy. By all rights, he'll be like a two, three, four defenseman rather than a true number one defenseman. But how many are those really to pick from? If there really was one, he'd probably be going top three. You know what this is? And this happens every year, given whichever position is weak. Teams overvalue position. This is not a strong defensive draft. It's not. The, if we were going by straight talent right now, I could absolutely hear an argument for two defensemen going in the top 20 of this draft. I think on my final rankings with how I the few tweaks I've made, I think I only have two defensemen in my top 20 right now. Um, it, it's no different than the 2018 draft where it was very light on centers. So we saw Montreal reach for Kotkaniemi. We saw Arizona reach for Barrett Hayton and, and centers kept getting overvalued because there weren't many of them. I think that's what's going to happen with this draft. There are not a lot of good defensemen. Couple that with um, a lot of NHL front offices having a misguided approach to what you need in a defenseman in the current NHL. And then you you have this perfect storm of a bunch of teams reaching where they wouldn't. Would I be shocked if Detroit took Sanderson at four? No, I wouldn't. And that's horrifying to me. But yeah, it, yeah 100%. It, it could happen because... I mean, sure, positionally, he fills a need for Detroit uh, as a left defenseman. But, man, I do not consider him a top 15 talent, so (laughs) that would upset me deeply. But, yeah, it's we see this every year, just to varying degrees. I just think this year it's going to be the perfect storm of uh, chaos, which from an entertainment value, oh, I'm here for it. Oh, give it to me. This is going to be, once we get past the top three, this draft is completely unpredictable, and I love it. Might even start at two this year. Yeah, honestly. Might start a lot sooner than we think. Like, do we think Philip Zadina would drop to six? Like, he was pretty much a consensus number two at that point. Um, I think the top ten is going to be just chaos this year at the draft, and that's Hopefully good for us. I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, I just hope we don't have to make a hard dis- hard choice on a prospect. Hopefully we have nothing to do with it. Just give How, us yeah. Lafreniere and let us sit back and watch the world implode. That is what I want. How fun would a June draft have been? Oh, this is the year, right? See, because here's what I'm hoping for. Assuming Detroit wins the draft lottery, I am I am rooting for Jake Sanderson to go like three. I, that is the level oh. of chaos I am here for. Hell yeah, man. As like long it. as Detroit is not part of it. If we're in the top four, I want Lafreniere, Byfield, Raymond, or Stutzla. I am not overthinking this. Those are my four. If Ottawa wins picks, I hope it goes Detroit, Ottawa, Ottawa, and Detroit takes Lafreniere, and Ottawa takes Jake Sanderson and Yaroslav Askarov. Hell yeah. Just Let's completely do buck wild. I don't even care if they pan out. If Ottawa hits home runs on both of them, I'm still happy. This is great. This is great. The chaos, the, yeah, the chaos in, in the draft is so much fun. And I honestly, 
yeah it, oh people are gonna be like oh it's you know a few hours and then it's done like what what entertainment is that it's something or man i watched they, who says it's a few hours of entertainment to, we're still talking about Mo Sider going sixth overall <laughs> unexpectedly. That was a year ago. This is endless amounts of entertainment. It would have been this weekend, eh? The draft. I know. Right. Oh, yeah. Thanks we would have been reminding there. me. Instead yeah. of being drunk on a patio in Montreal, uh, reflecting on the first round of the draft, I'm going to be on my couch having anxiety sweats over a, uh, a draft lottery that's a farce. Yeah, the- no, I'm... This is way better, Ryan. Thanks for reminding me. The furthest thing he went, Brad, he went from smoked meat protein sweats to in your house on your couch anxiety sweats. Yeah, yeah, Sad. and I definitely prefer one of them over the other. the The draft lottery is gonna. Oh man, you know I preach. We all preach. That's all we do on the show is preach. Um, <laughs> someone said once, "You guys are preachy." Yeah, man. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Like during the season, we're a little preachy. When there's no hockey to talk about, it's all we can do, man. Just, just we, let us have it. We preach, let it go. We preach, just expect the worst. And I'm just, I just know, I just know how upset I'm going to be when it's fourth. I just, oh, it's yeah. going to hurt so much. See, here's the thing this is what hockey has broken in my brain. I expect the worst. I get angry about scenarios like this, and yet I'll spend the rest of the summer talking about, oh, it's okay. We're still getting a great player at number four. Oh, what an amazing year. Like, I will do everything in my power to rationalize how good of a situation it's in, despite my initial anger. And then, guess what's going to happen next year? The same goddamn cycle. I hate it. But I do it. Yeah, this year's... This year is different because of how high end of a talent the you're supposed to be. But let's let's save it. Let's just see what happens on Friday. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe it's third and not fourth. <laughs> you, would it be? Would we? Not even we. Would I be so angry? And I'm asking you guys about how I feel because I can't make up my mind. Would I be this angry about this stupid system if Detroit hadn't already collectively lost six spots in the draft from the last three draft lotteries? No. No, I think the hard thing about this draft for me is I will be happy with anyone at one to four, but considering the season we just had to endure, picking third or fourth certainly feels like a like we lost the silver medal or lost the bronze medal game. Like it just does not feel like it's worth the pain and suffering we went through. So here's the worst part about if we drop the fourth ryan i'm gonna ask you a series of questions here and we're gonna probably find a pattern about why this is gonna suck (laughs) so if the detroit red wings are picking fourth would you be surprised if they drafted jamie drysdale no cole perfetti no lucas raymond no marco rossi no alex holtz no jake sanderson let, less no, but still no. <laughs> Yaroslav Askarov. Again, less no, but still no. Jack Quinn. Yeah, yeah okay, I'd be surprised, Jack Quinn. Okay, I had to literally go outside of my top 10 to find someone you wouldn't be. And, and, and Sanderson wasn't <laughs> even in my top 10. So I had to go to, like, number 11 to get someone you wouldn't be surprised the Red Wings to take at four. Look, man, that last year level- broke me. Listen, man, I have enough anxiety going into the draft lottery. I don't, I can't handle that level of anxiety going into the actual draft. I'm for it. I'm for stressing Brad out for good content. I'll do oh it. Oh my God. I don't it's care about not, your blood pressure. This is not good for my health, Ryan. I might not make it to the draft. I'm old. I have kids. Uh, my Is it possible for your veins to just burst? Oh yeah, it happens. Yeah. Definitely. Oh yeah. And that's definitely happening. Sometime you know vein surgery August. is a thing? What? Vein surgery is a thing. Yeah, you can operate on basically anything. Why did that sound so creepy? Why do you? Why did you say that so intimately? I didn't like I, that. I am in my basement right now, Ryan. Uh, you only have a very small window of what you can see behind me. That's unfortunately and fortunately true. Um, speaking about you not making it, that it's it's a win win because it's either yeah the show goes on as is, or um, Evan and I have both taken out a pretty big life insurance policy on you, so. Oh, um, nice. That, that's how we're going to buy that cottage that we were talking about before the episode. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. So draft lottery, anything else that we want to talk about before Friday, um, before we move on to the 
Hall of Very Good. I'm upset we talked about it this far. <laughs> Again, Draft Lottery Friday at 8 Eastern. Our live stream will start closer to 7 Eastern. Check uh, check us out on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod or on Instagram or Facebook or wherever. Follow us if you're not. Follow our individual accounts if you don't. And uh, we'll post the link to the live stream there. It'll be good fun. We'll do our best to make it a good show for you. Um, at the very least, we can all suffer together. Um, okay. The Hockey Hall of Fame inductees were announced. And um, most notably for the Red Wings, um, Red Wings legend uh, Daniel Alfredson did not make it. But builder, well-deserved Ken Holland uh, made it in, which was um, really, really good. Ken Holland um, obviously deserves it, was at the head of one of the most successful and dominant sports franchises of its time. Um, I would argue of all time, the Detroit Red Wings. So, um, you know, it, it's excellent to see Holland go in. I think builders are, um, extremely underrated in the hall and, and it was, it was a nice reward and it kind of removed the sour taste in your mouth that we had after the very, very tail end of uh, Holland's tenure in Detroit. Um, and the other inductees were Marion Hosa, Jerome McGinla, Kevin Lowe as a player and not as a builder, Kim St. Pierre and uh, Doug Wilson, right? Yes. Yeah, Doug Wilson. Notably left out, Daniel Alfredson, um, Alex McGillney, uh, Flurry, Brenda Moore, Gonchar, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, I'm, I, I'm just looking for reasons to be angry today, but Alex McGillney not getting in alone is criminal. And then you factor in that Kevin Lowe. <laughs> and Doug Wilson, <laughs> who have both been eligible for over two decades each, all of a sudden now get in is, oh man, it's it's insane to me. Uh, just to quote a tweet that I saw earlier today, Alex McGillney has more career points than Hall of Famers Pat LaFontaine, Dave Keon, Lanny McDonald, Paul Correa, Rocket Richard. A higher goals per game average than Gordie Howe, Steve Eiserman, and Joe Sackick. And only three players in NHL history scored more goals in a single season than Alex McGillney's 76 in 92-93. I can't sum that up any better than that. Kevin Lowe was a very good hockey player, but I'd be willing to bet a good amount of money Edmonton would have won all those cups without him. <laughs> It sucks to say because, like, of course he had an important part to play on that team. But when you're being, when yeah. you're led by Gretzky and Messier, like, what are you like, supposed to? And and I, I understand that we are just three stupid hockey talking heads. I get that. So when I pick on other hockey talking heads, I'm I'm aware of just how dumb that is. But I'm going to now because I obviously work in hockey during the day, and we had. Um, a live reaction on the TVs that we were all listening to after the announcement was made and the gibberish garbage old like talking heads spit out about why a player is good. Uh, an excuse they used to why Kevin Lowe got in was he got the pluck, the puck to the players who needed it. Yes. Uh, great opinion. If I was on the ice with Wayne Gretzky, I would also try to get him the puck. That is great insight. I'm, I'm glad Kevin Lowe was a revolutionary thinker back in the eighties. Then they started, don't get me wrong. I, in my opinion, Marion Hossa is a hall of famer, maybe not first ballot, but he, he was a hall of famer. So getting in first ballot on a weaker year. Sure. But then there's, they're talking about, Oh, he's one of the greatest defensive forwards in hockey history. So, the guy who never won a Selkie is one of the greatest defensive forwards in hockey history. I'm sorry, where what were the voters doing all those years? Pavel Datsuk better make it in on his zeroth ballot. Like he's... no, yeah, the Carboneau getting in last year and um, Hosa getting in first ballot. I will no longer hear a debate for Datsuk and Zetterberg not getting in. They are first ballot locks, locks. And if you try to argue me, you are wrong. And you may be right in your opinion. <laughs> you tell them, Brad. <laughs> you may be right in your opinions, but based on a Hockey Hall of Fame prerequisites and precedents, 
I'm sorry, there's no debate. They're in comfortably. But yet, Alex McGillney, one of the greatest scorers of the dead puck era, not in. The first Russian defector to the NHL, and not Russian to play in the NHL, but actually defect and run away from the Iron Curtain to play in the NHL. So he also has history on his side. And that whole story is crazy, too. There's a documentary, I think Sportsnet did it, up on YouTube. Watch it. The KGB like, were all over that. It's wild. Like, it's not hyperbole to say McGilney risked his life to come play in the NHL. And yet... That's the least we can do. Get, let him in the Hall of Fame. Put him in the for Hall God's of Fame. God's sake. You don't even need the history to make the case for McGilney. I mean, Doug Wilson, I it took him 24 years to get in, so I don't know what they were looking at the last 24 years that changed this year, but whatever. Although he was, I think, criminally underrated because he was one of the better defensemen for about a decade and he never did get the respect because he was up against Bork and Coffee in his era. Um, so I have less of a problem with him than Kevin Lowe, but it's just, I don't, it's... It's this old boy hockey mentality of it's like the year Drew Doughty won the Norris. Ah, he didn't really deserve it this year, but he's due. <laughs> and so they they okay, give it to him. Because again, that year Eric Carlson was the clear cut Norris winner, but he's had enough. We gotta give it to Drew Doughty. This this year, Alex McGillney is the clear cut guy behind a Gimla. Kevin Lowe and Dougie Wilson have been waiting a while. They're due. It's they said I I read Kevin Lowe. I'm like Really? Like his Edmonton teams that he ran were not very good. I don't really understand why you'd put him in as a builder. And someone was like, no, as a player. And I was like, oh, boy, is that a pick? That's that's an opinion. That That's for sure. Um, boy, would I have loved to have been in the room when they were debating this year's class. They, oh. need, to, they need to maybe expand the classes. Brad might be old, but he's not part of the. He's not old enough to be part of the old boys club. No, thank you. Brad's in like flux. He's not young enough. He's you in purgatory what? right now. He's a thousand years old and yet still not old enough to be in the old boys club. That's yeah, yeah, that's the problem. I'm too old for the old boys club. Regardless, though, it's good to see Iggy get in there. Um, I think Marion Host is one of the best two way forwards of his generation. Um, What's it that look? Did I not just cover that? No, I'm just saying. If like, you were going to say he's one of the best two way forwards of his generation, I would expect to see at least a Selkie on his mantle. Oh well, no, but that's fine. Like, I like I agree with you. Was he first ballot? I wouldn't have pegged him as first ballot. I thought maybe he'd be pushed to second ballot, especially with like McGillney up. Um, I thought Alfredson would have gotten in, honestly, just by name value alone. Um, I mean, Alfredson definitely gets in. It is very much the hall of very good now. I mean, Guy Carbono, Kevin Lowe. Hey, at least uh, Iggy and Kim St. Pierre were no-brainers this year. Yeah. And honestly, Ken Holland was a no-brainer as a builder. So at least. They yeah. Can. What's the rule on builders? When can they go in? Whenever? Whenever. Oh, that's that's like when Gary Bettman went in. It's like the, the Obama meme where Obama <laughs> puts the medal on Obama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, Obama. I don't I don't get too worked about too worked up about the hockey hall for that exact reason. It's it's like not that these guys' opinions don't matter. Obviously they're they're the foundation of the game, but at the same time, like it does just feel like old the old boys voting in their buddies so they can have the, the full the, class in there. The final stroke off. Yeah. Someone asked Gretzky what he thought. I'm like, of course Gretzky's gonna vote for low. He was on his friggin' team. <laughs> like what are they gonna say? Like, yeah, I guess. Like people are gonna say, like Ryan, who are your favorite pod- podcast hosts? I'm gonna be like, well, obviously like Evan and Steve Dangle. Like it's clear that way. By the way, <laughs> Steve, surprise baby is an all time move. Oh yeah, that is that is next level baby announcement. The did you, surprise baby. What did did you see that, Evan? No. Uh, Steve Dangle put out his vi- his most recent video is called First Overall Pick, and so. Adam Lascaris actually sent it to me. He's like, have you seen this one yet? And I saw the title. I'm like, oh, this will be relevant to Detroit. And I, I watched these videos from time to time. And I opened it up. And it was like, he was saying, it's not really relevant to the first overall pick, but kind of. He's like, we have a big, uh, me and my wife have a big like announcement for the ne- our next stage of life. He's like, no, no, before you you ask, no, she's not pregnant. And he just holds up a baby. He's oh, like, shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that that's, uh, they kept that is a baby v- reveal, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Forget gender I would, reveal, just... Ta-da! 
for someone as public as Steve and who talks as much as Steve, for him to keep that a secret for nine months is incredible. Insane. Baby Leo, uh, future Detroit Red Wings draft pick in 2038. Uh, mm, the Red Wings only get one first round pick in 2038, and you're crazy if you think that won't be Henrik Crisco. <laughs> Well, no. How do you know it's only going to be one pick? 2037 is going to be a rough year, and they're going to... That's fair. We could get whatever. Uh, Leo Dangle could be the second first-round pick. Detroit's going to win their first overall pick um, by uh, virtue of their own uh, a proper lottery system or the gold plan. And then they're also going to have like a 15th overall pick that's going to move up to second overall, and that's going to be Leo. Yeah, there we go. And then we can watch Steve uh, in all his Leafs gear melt down in the stands. Yeah, like the, it's going to be the best. Be uh, but no, congratulations to Steve. Um, it's funny because I was actually going to message him. I was like, hey, we have to have you on soon to talk about this thing. And I was just like, oh, we might have to wait a little while for that because he'll have a baby. Yeah, they take care. up some time. I honestly was the only other person who I think could pull that off is Evan. Evan yeah, could have probably. three kids right now and I would believe it. That's why I got a lock on the door. <laughs> you know, I actually, Brad, I kid you not, I actually look at his hands a lot when I see them just to see if there's a ring on there. <laughs> there's not. <laughs> That's another expensive venture. <laughs> I will not go splitsies with you on that, Evan. I said yes to the cottage, but not that. Oh, that would that would make my life a lot easier, actually. So well, if, he, if he doesn't have a cottage by the end of the year, we know he spent money on something else. That's true. Could you be know, a house. Who knows? Mel actually has an heirloom ring in her family, so I have that covered for me. I don't have to. Yeah, you lucky bastard. Well, she'll break up with me first, inevitably. Yeah, it's fair. She just spent the last, like, forever building this custom mantle for our fireplace that she also custom built the surround for. And it's a gorgeous mantle, and it's like it wraps around. It was not easy to make. And she did this all painstakingly and like worked her ass off for it. It's beautiful. I'm excited for her to put the reveal pictures up. And as she was bringing me downstairs to show me like the near finished product, I was watching Steve's video and the baby came up and so I was just paying attention to my freaking phone. <laughs> as Mel's trying to show me this mantle, this poor, this poor girl's been working on it forever. And then I'm just like, Steve had a baby. She's like, all has, right. Has anybody told Ryan that there's a pause button? On showing me a mantle i didn't know that that would have been very God useful damn it. <laughs> yeah anyways i don't have long before she dumps me <laughs> um hockey hall very good it gives it bolsters the red wings um, we'll have the osgood argument on a different day because i know everyone is rear- chomping at the bit for that um return to play very quickly before we head into overtime it looks like vancouver is one of the hub cities uh apparently rumors are going around today they've ran into some hiccups so who the hell knows anymore what hiccups? Uh, I don't know. I just saw hiccups. Uh, it could just be they have some logistical things they're working out. I don't. I really don't know. It's there's certain teams have been um, apparently they've narrowed it down to six. So certain teams have been told that they are not in contention. Yeah. Uh, Pittsburgh, Ve- Minnesota, Columbus, and someone else have been told to kick rocks. Uh, Vegas, Chicago, L.A., Edmonton, Toronto, and Vancouver are the top six. So. Huh. Yeah, Edmonton, Edmonton, the premier of Edmonton or premier of Edmonton, premier of Alberta put out a video saying come to Edmonton. It was this like tourism video. None of the shots featured Edmonton. It was like mountains and travel and stuff. And I'm like, they're not going to do any of that. They're going to stay in a Marriott. (laughs) (laughs) This is what a stupid, what a stupid thing. Anyways, it was hysterical. Um, I still think Edmonton should be one of the cities because it... (sighs) It's not a metropolis like L.A. is or Toronto is. Vancouver, yeah, great. I heard they started to like look at the process of booking hotels, but eh, this is all I heard. They heard, she heard, he heard kind of thing. So nothing confirmed yet. Um, and the streak of people promising news by the end of the week and nothing coming about continues during this quarantine. Anything else, guys, before we head into um, a very fat overtime section here? Uh, no. No, all right. So this is a, yeah, this is a midweek episode. This is a midweek episode of the Wingdeal Podcast, so overtime is Patreon exclusive. Um, Patreon.com slash Wingdeal Podcast if you want to support the show. These are the people who make this show happen. Um, doesn't matter if we have 
you know, one comment or a hundred. We love reading them out because these guys are what allow us to uh, do this thing during hashtag these trying times. So thank you all. Thank you, local patron. We'll start with Eric O, who says, play along. Let's say it's draft day with Ottawa set to pick first, uh, Detroit third. Before Ottawa is set to go on stage to pick first overall, Bettman walks up to announce a trade. The Ottawa Senators have traded the first overall pick of the 2020 draft to the Detroit Red Wings in exchange for. Each of you try to finish the sentence with a considerable trade that you think Eisenman could pull, pull off without setting us back in the rebuild. Thanks, fellas. Uh, without setting us back in the rebuild? Well, that's a whole other argument because if Ottawa is willing to give up Alexi Lafreniere to go down two spots, uh, you're not giving up a fringe piece. You are sending them Philip Zadina or Mo Sider. Yeah, my answer here was the third overall pick and Mo Sider. Yeah, and I love Lafreniere. Would not do that. You cannot give up two, not quite franchise players, but we'll call them cornerstone pieces at their position. Would you do the third overall pick, next year's first round pick, Valeno and McIsaac? No. Really? First, third, uh, another yeah, first yeah. Valeno and McIsaac? Are you dreaming? No. Yeah, maybe that was a bit much. What about next year's first and McIsaac and this year's third overall pick? No. I would I would, I would do that. Nope. I don't know. Kalen Wood but said... You're, you're just looking at picks. So the, the trade could... Like, I'll say our pick next year's fifth overall for the sake of easy argument, okay? You're giving up Carson Lambos, Jared McIsaac, and Tim Stutzla. Yeah, okay, that's fair. You put it that way. I always forget how strong the defensive class is next year. Yes. Caitlin Wood has a very important comment here. It says, just be cool, folks. Be cool. Things are probably going to maybe be fine, I bet, most likely. Drink a beer or eight. Seriously, though, first time commenting in a while. We are all in the shit storm together. Let's be excellent to one another. Cheers, boys. And rem remember, wherever we fall and whoever we get to join the winged wheel, it isn't as important as respecting and accepting who it is. Very, very astute. And that last line is um, what we will all have to lean on. We got good at it last year because we were all upset about the Mo Cider pick, but now we love him. We went to love him after like a day. It didn't take long. After his first, pro like the first day of like prospect camp, I'm like, oh, he's got hands. You good. That's a new development. K Waz says, so Steve Dangle and his wife had their first child. Congrats to them. The quick story of it was quite a tearjerker. Now back to other topics or whatever. When do you realistically think this damn virus will actually be in the rearview mirror? I have to think late fall or early winter. Uh, it depends on what you define as a rearview mirror. Because if you uh, think we're going to have no... Uh, so here's when is what, hockey going to be back? 2021. So here's what most experts that I've been reading have been saying. This is in our rearview mirror when a majority of the population has already caught it or we have a vaccine and neither of which is likely within the next year. <laughs> anyway, not not great news. Nope, not great news at all. Flying update. If you saw my post in the discord, I just started formation training. I named my section Red Wing. Instructors have teased me about the name because it can be a little tough to say quickly. Well, oops. Now, we're not the Blue Angels. We maintain a comfortable three feet of separation, but we as students are just trying to suck as little as possible. Hope all is well, and may the COVID cease ASAP. Can you imagine flying three feet away in a fighter jet? No. No. Uh, James Phoenix says, Good day, Winged Wheel Podcast. Just two days to go here in Down Underland until D-Day. We all get to deliberate and suffer potential heartache over Lafreniere, Stutzel, Byfield, Marco Rossi, or some random off-the-board pick. My question being a closet Euro is, the, do you think there is value of either Lucas Reichel or JJ Paterka in particular are still available at 32? I love the idea of a German nucleus in the wings, a lot with Mort Sider already in the setup, but not at the expense of a potentially better player who may have slipped down. Anyway, keep up the good work as always and hashtag retire 91. There would have to be someone very significant to fall for them to not be my pick if they're at 32 because I have them ranked 19th and 20th respectively. Yeah, if it's something crazy like Connor Zary falls there or, you know, I think Ridley Gregg, there's actually a good chance of him being there. Um, there's a few centermen in the middle of the first round that I would consider over them, but at the same time, they would be like, complete wins for me in my mind at pick 32 for whatever it's worth in bob mckenzie's rankings both were in the first round yeah 
Uh, C Nod says, Brad, we made uh, trabuckets in middle school, and maybe they don't do that north of the border, but I launched a ball 35 feet or 10 meters for y'all. Um, okay, onto the draft. I've, so I've seen some people saying with fourth, we take a defenseman. I think that's the safe pick, but super unexciting. If we do, what are the chances of the top defensive prospects making the NHL next year? Okay. This is a fallacy. There have been studies and analytics that show it is harder to correctly project defensemen in the first round than it is forwards. Forwards are safer picks in the first round because their skills are far easier to predict and translate. So if we want a safe pick at four, we are taking a forward. And if the only two defensemen that should be considered, well, the only defenseman that should be considered at four is Jamie Drysdale, and he is absolutely not ready to go in the lineup next year. No, I don't think any of these defensemen are ready. Um, I don't think it's quite there yet. Uh, Kyle Sanders says, hello there. I'm actually going to go crazy soon. My puppy is currently in heat and is bleeding like a stuffed pig. Jeez. Send send help. I'm also 19. So quick beer slash alcohol recommendations. (laughs) Any right now. The highest proof you can find. Yeah. Moonshine. Um, all in all, you guys mean a lot to me as finding any happiness in my life is a challenge. And you all seem like a good bunch of guys, despite being Michigan fans, which I can excuse, but I just have one important thing to say. There are two main types of trebuchets. The first is the traction trebuchet or <laughs> manganel, which uses manpower to swing the arm. It first appeared in China in the fourth century BC carried westward by the Avars. The technology was adopted by the Byzantines in the late sixth century AD and by their neighbors in the following centuries, the later and often larger counterweight trebuchet also known as the counterpoise trebuchet uses a counterweight to swing the arm it appeared in both christian and muslim lands around the mediterranean in the 12th century and made its way back to china via mongol conquest in the 13th century ryan why is you a bitch uh and not finish the holy gospel you godless freak that was a whirlwind of a comment there it is the first interesting thing i've heard of trebuchets how did you still say it wrong i don't fucking care <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, Can't take it anymore. Uh Catapult says, since you've been cutting my comment off, aka state sponsored censorship, I'm doing it all in reverse this episode. Stay fresh, choose bugs. Jersey time, you Muppets misunderstood last week's question, so let's try it again. Top three jerseys of the last ten first overall picks being the jersey they wore in their draft year, i.e. CHL, etc. Oh, oh. USNTDP oh, yeah. is not in there. Frolunda, Halifax Mooseheads. Oh, ZS- Halifax is up there. Yeah, ZSC Lions. Like the European jerseys with the sponsors just automatically get. I don't know. Frolunda's Frilunda, still got a strong uniform. They do. Barry Colts, no. Sarnia Sting. Eh. One, two, three, Eerie? Four, five, Connor McDavid is eerie, no, right? Eer- Eerie's are a jumbled mess, and then they tried simplifying them and somehow made them worse. Um,. How are the Bear. Red Deer Rebels? Bear. Oh, Red Deers, Red Deers are good. Okay, we'll go Red Deer. I'm uh, going Halifax, Halifax. Rolanda, Red Deer. Yeah. That's yeah, because it's weak. Like, Barry's not there. Barry's all right. I don't mind Barry. I hate their logo. Really? It's like yeah. the it's peak junior hockey logo. Wait, isn't London Knights in there too? No, I think they are the 11th pick back. Uh, 2007? Six. It would be yeah, their eleventh. It was yeah. uh, John Tavares. Yeah. Oh yeah, wow. he got drafted out of London, not Oshawa. That's right. Um, longer term listeners will remember Brad as a diehard Dallas Stars fan. So I'm curious who he'd like his beloved Stars to target at. Will pro- what will probably be pick twenty something. Uh, Reichel. Sure. Now uh, we cross live to golf guy. Huh? What? Can you repeat huh? the question? Shut up. Just name a random 2020 prospect, mate. Jack Quinn. There we go. That was the first one that came (laughs) to my head. Cool. Uh, B1 and B2, give us an NHL comparison to uh, Golf Guy's prospect. Comparison for Jack Quinn? Um, Alex Dabrinkit. I think Alex Dabrinkit's a... uh, Yeah. yeah, yeah. Dabrinkit, Kaliev. I think I think Wheeler said Kaliev, so I'll cheat and steal Wheeler's answer. Kaliev is not a chiller yet. Okay, get well. On, get on board. To brink it, it is. Brad's right. That ruined my day. Garrett TV says, uh, sorry, he goes on to say, anyway, only a few more days until phase one of the draft, of draft, p- 
pain is over. Garrett TV says, Hockey Amigos, it's been a minute. Two things. One, age. If you're still talking about it, you're not old. Once you're actually old, you have given up and forgotten the number. It's liberating. Two, hazing. How do we fix this cancerous cultural issue? I never played at the level you guys have, but I know the issues start early, really early. How do we address it before it starts and holds people accountable? We have to get over the pseudo macho man bullshit. Pro tip, it's not just a hockey problem. Good on Carcillo for putting pressure about it. Anyways, drive for show, put putt for dough. Let's go Red Wings. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, yeah, the the issue of hazing and, and you know, major junior sports culture culture in general there's no one there's no silver bullet for this there's a lot of things that need to change here one thing is a lot of the times these kids their kids are moving across the country or across the continent or across the world to play hockey you know to further their careers because that's what they have to do and yeah they have billet families but really like not really there's no real focus on school like Dion Phaneuf writing NHL at the top of a test and handing it in blank um, there's no support structure there for them to grow in a lot of different ways and like these kids don't have i don't know i don't like there's no silver bullet to this and i don't have a a clear explanation for any different facet but at the, the end of the day it's like kids who play sports and that's their entire life like there just needs to be some diversity in what they do and some structure and focus in different areas and the nip it what can you even say nip it in the bud if it's just pervasive throughout all sports coaches and uh team administrators need to be held accountable as well i don't know if you guys have anything to add to this Nah, you didn't get enough (laughs) thanks thanks guys wow there's gonna be a lot to talk about that um this this thing isn't going away any anytime soon and i agree it's good that carcilla put pressure on it uh, Lonnie Zone says, you know, since the league shut down, aside from the final Iser press conference, being a Red Wings fan hasn't meant much of substance to me, if not for the Winged Wheel podcast. So thanks for that service, gentlemen. Yeah, that's really nice. I appreciate it. Uh, anyways, in the last episode, you guys mentioned the potential respective pineapple and completely justified mustache related demises of Ryan and Brad, and that the podcast would be left in Evan's hands. Would that mean the YouTube version may include Evan pontificating on the Red Wings through a GoPro strapped to his forehead while playing nine holes? Would be a bizarre exercise, but I kind of want to see that. And heck, Ryan and Brad could even stay alive for it, I guess. Maybe a Patreon exclusive? Serious question before I go. If two or all three of the top three picks are taken by placeholders, how bad do you think the play-in round can get with some teams deciding they'd rather take their chances at a top three pick? Do you think it'll promote tanking in the play-in round? Anyways, thanks again for all you guys do. Let's go get that fourth overall selection, boys. Yes. I... As much as... As funny as it would be to say yes... uh, for all intents and purposes, the playing round is playoffs. And I don't think you'll ever get a player to be able to tank um, during a playoff series, no matter how long their odds are to win the cup. Yeah. Management might make some questionable decisions. Yeah. Um, but once, once any decision gets to the room, like to the coaches or the players, it's a hundred percent go. That potential prospect is going to take their job yeah but players never tank teams tank like you said coaches and gms but here's the thing the team's rosters for the most part are set like could you imagine like what would montreal have to do to tank right now they would literally have to not put carry price on the playoff roster they'd have to have montreal's players and play them (laughs) connor mcdavid is healthy scratch tonight oh this person has covid symptoms Mm think of it this way you're Barkov and or you're Barkov you're Florida and you lose like Barkov to injury and another like key player to uh you know a COVID positive test are you not then out there you know playing your third or fourth line for way too many minutes Mike Babcock style because you're like screw this I'll take a top three pick Uh, again once it gets to the players and the coaches mm, all bets are off um if you, I would happily record a stupid like watching us 
muck our way through a round of golf if you guys want and post that patreon exclusive i don't care i don't think you guys would be interested in it but if there's at least a few of you i'm sure evan would be thrilled to take us it'll be the first evan led venture of the winged wheel podcast i mean i'm golfing next tuesday i could wear a gopro but that would i don't know how much you guys just want to go for a walk through the woods honestly <laughs> there'd be no if if he did it to me there'd be no audio we could use because it's just me swearing at myself we can swear patreon exclusive oh, we made that well, rule for you well then and that's all that's all it would be brad's tree bucket says first uh first off back on the 13th my wife got me a new set of golf clubs for my birthday they're stratas i guess they're made by callaway i'm excited to get back out there since i haven't been on a course in five years okay enough golf talk i'm ready to be heard again this friday also is it weird for me to kind of watch stutzla over lafreniere i don't know why that is i just find his skating puck handling and creativity to be so exciting and the fact that he can play center and wing helps plus who doesn't want to see a cider stutzla bromance Look, man, I, I get why you love Stutzla, and I might even get to the point where I'd want Stutzla's second overall, but it is weird to like him over Lafreniere. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's... Yeah, no. Haroon Khan says, hey, boys, I'm going to stay away from the lottery talk. I don't want to jinx it. However, what makes Kyle Dubas a good GM? I don't see the hype around him. Is it just an average guy being hyped up because he's in Toronto? No, he's got the right mentality for how to build a winner, because I know a lot of people mocked him for how much he spent on his on his what do you want to call them core four forwards but i agree with that mentality it's hard to get players like Tavares, nylander matthews and marner so when you get them hold on tight build your team around skill it's easier to get the ron hainsies of the world than it is to get the william nylanders of the world um i think he's obviously made some missteps that's gonna happen no gm's perfect like Acquiring Cody CC and actually giving him a contract is a problem, but he got Cody CC while unloading another terrible defenseman, so it wasn't completely indefensible. Um, just like Cody CC is completely incapable of playing defense, but it's bad. It's real bad. bad. Real bad. But yeah, it's uh, he's got Morgan Riley locked up long term. He's got a good goalie. Um, there's still a couple holes he needs to fill, but like even some of his. Uh, lesser moves last year paid off real well before he got that scary wrist injury. Ilya Mikheyev was looking like a revelation in the Leafs' bottom six, and they signed him from Russia for a song. Yeah, Soupy. He he worked out great. So he needs probably two more defensemen, which are hard to get. And he took logical swings like Tyson Berry and Jake Muzzin were good moves. Uh, Jake Muzzin worked out. Tyson Berry didn't. That happens. So, uh, again, he hasn't made many moves that I personally disagree with. He just, some of them haven't worked yet. If Toronto drafts third overall, do they take Drysdale? I, you know me and my best player available always, but Jesus, they might have to. They might have to, right? They might have to pull a, uh, uh, I can't remember his name with the porcupine hair, calling the other GM and asking who they're going to take to see who the fourth overall pick wants and... Oh, happened in the cadre draft brian burke when yeah brian burke brian murray yeah oh man that was funny that was funny who do you time. want cadre okay we're taking him <laughs> Just, hey fuck you buddy <laughs> um no i i don't there's a lot to be said for a gm just doing the right thing and, and who they had before like lou lamorello i'll be the first to make a joke at lou lamorello's expense of course but you know he is a a, a story gm he has had a lot of success but the reality is this is a guy that was focusing on making players were clean making sure players were clean shaven that the numbers didn't go too high and signing was it komarov that they signed to a ridiculous contract i can't remember who yes. it was and matt martin yeah martin and then you had the hainsey contract it's like that's the kind of thing that just hampers your team it wasn't very dissimilar from what red wings fans hated about what ken holland was doing at the later stages of his tenure in detroit so switching to someone who just does the basic things right it's a world of difference. Um, I agree. He hasn't gotten his core four in for cheap, and that is something good GMs can sometimes do. But you also have to think he's in a pretty atypical situation because, you know, Matthews, Marner, Tavares are three of the best players on the planet. So it's pretty hard to get them in cheap. And whether you like it or not, he did get Tavares in at a market discount. He could have gone for a million more. Uh, Darren Helm, Stan Club says, hey, guys, it's me again. Back to... Uh, 
Back to hold he who is all holy, the one and only Darren Helm in high regard. The trebuchet trebucket mix up was a laugh, but people have made much worse mistakes. Someone once told me that D- the DK and Danny DK meant defensive king. Obviously, that's a mess up. But when unpacking this mistake, I heard the phrase almost as bad as the Darren Helm is elite joke. Jokes are not the same thing as facts. So hardy har, laugh as you misspoke yet again. Excited for the draft lottery. I will be watching with a bottle of whiskey in hand. Either way, it will be necessary. As always, number 43 forever. Brad, you almost had a friend there and then you ruined it. Nick Hill oh, says, right. <laughs> Nick Hill says, decide to finally become a patron so I can make fun of Brad for his pronunciation of trebuchet. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Kind of. Well, Nick, welcome to the Dub Dub family. And uh, Brad, look, you accidentally did something good. If me screwing up gets people to pay us, I'll come up with something <laughs> dumb every episode. Yeah, you usually take care of that, uh, whether you're trying it or not, pal. So, uh, The first episode I listened to was the 2019 draft review. Since then, I've been hooked and have listened to every single episode. Keep up the good work, guys, even you, Brad. Really appreciate that. I love hearing when people started. Um, we don't really know. Like, There's no way really to track unless you tell us. So that's That's awesome to see. Austin Trotman says, have you guys seen the Trevor Bauer, Aubrey Huff beef on Twitter right now? Who do you think would be most likely to pull something like that in the NHL? Also, who do you guys think should be in the Hockey Hall of Fame but isn't there slash won't get in? I uh, haven't seen Trevor. I, I know Trevor Bauer is a little bit wild on Twitter. Don't know who Aubrey Huff is. Buddy. Oh, man. do not. If you do not know who Aubrey Huff is, good. <laughs> Keep it that way. That man is unhinged. I will uh, give in to my morbid curiosity no, later. No, don't. Don't. That bad, oh, this eh? is already looking bad. <laughs> Don't he, he makes Trevor Bauer look sane. Does he have a Twitter account? Oh, he does. Yeah, Trevor it, Bauer, I know, is a little bit off the cuff. Oh, he no. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that bad. Whoa. Mm. Oh my god. Just his description on his profile on Twitter is bad enough. Maybe don't read it out. I don't want to know. Yeah. <sighs> no, 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 Evan. Um, Ryan, with some of the... I'm not giving any airtime to that chunk. Yeah, and also with uh, Ryan, some of your self-imposed rules on this podcast. Yeah, no, we can't read anything of Aubrey Huff's. I just hate editing, man. Uh, yep, oh, we Ryan. can't read any of that. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, if if this Twitter feed was, uh, was our podcast, you'd be just showing a blank canvas. Is it just our pre-show? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't actually talk like that. I haven't seen it, but we're not... We're stupid people, not bad people. Um, who do we think won't get into the hockey hall? Chris Osgood. Yeah, that's true. Look, the Chris Osgood truthers get more and more leverage every day. Every year a new draft class is announced. Yeah. Grant Fear can get in. Chris Osgood can get in. Neither should be in. <laughs> Josh Rosnowski says, hi, guys. How are you doing? I'm fine. Not fine. I've also been doing some meditation, drinking. And reflection, stress eating, and really taking the time to relax and not worry about the draft lottery, crying into my pillow. Anyways, in the name of tranquility, outside of the obvious hated teams, Original Six, Colorado, Pittsburgh, what are your weirdly disliked slash hated teams, and what are your weird teams that you like? I hate the Flames for almost no reason other than maybe ugly jerseys. Anyways, stay sane, hope for ping pong balls to determine my happiness. I hate the Anaheim Ducks and the San Jose Sharks more than you can imagine. Um... But those, they were red, former Red Wings rivals. Yeah, that makes sense. But I hate San Jose this year for giving another uh, Red Wings divisional rival two top five picks. So screw San Jose. They're still trying to hurt us. Um, A team that I hate that may, for absolutely no damned reason. I kind of agree with Calgary. I don't often find myself, pull, myself pulling for Calgary. I almost feel the same way about Edmonton, mostly because I'm just annoyed at how many good picks they wasted. But now that they have Connor McDavid, I like to see him play hockey. So, Man, I'm Minnesota. I don't like Minnesota all that much. Maybe it's just because they've been boring for the entirety of their existence. And I, I find myself, I don't know. I, I've always liked Carolina, and I've never been able to explain why. Um, I've always had an affinity for Washington. Um, always liked Brayden Holpe. Obviously, Ovi is entertaining as hell to watch. I love the city. Um, yeah, I always kind of, yeah, I, I, I gravitate towards Washington. Uh, can't think of a team that I hate for no reason. My hatred is very calculated. Calculated. But I, I've always liked Florida. Maybe it's because they get to live in a ultra warm state and <laughs> golf. It's in Pebble Beach in Florida. Days. And they have a beach. 
If if our podcast was based out of Florida, you would never see me. Pebble <laughs> Beach ever golf course. Where is Pebble? Pebble oh, Beach? that's uh, California. Oh, I knew that. Oh, it's in Pebble Beach, California. That makes sense. Uh, Drunky the Dwarf says, "Hey guys, Drunky the Dwarf here. I had some more edibles. So if you were to choose be, to be a superhero, who would you choose? I feel like this isn't. I feel like even." I feel like I feel like Evan isn't human, by the way. I've never heard him laugh. He must be a mole person or is Captain Raymond Holt. He makes the best jokes when he shows up and contributes. Trebuchet will never die and positive vibes for this draft lottery. Well, if you can be any superhero. Uh, Batman, I want that kind of wealth. Uh, Captain America would be cool. Brad, you could have said Iron Man because he's also ultra rich. Yeah, but he doesn't dress up like a bat. He has a similar beard to you. That's fair. Uh, yeah, maybe Captain America. Like, yeah, either Batman or Iron Man. Any anybody whose superpower is they have a lot of money. That's that's what I want. Yeah, you know what? Iron Man is it because the wealth is what you can be a superhero and freeze time and whatever. What are you gonna freeze time for to steal money? Like, just just be Iron Man and just be that rich and smart, regardless. Exactly. Or my second choice would be Evan. Fair enough. Fair Who would you choose, Evan? You can't choose um someone on the PGA tour. Oh, man. I'm so bad at picking superheroes because it's not something I'm well-versed in. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't... Pick a superpower and we'll tell you who I'll you are. I'll be Superman. How about that? My, I can hit my drive 700 yards. <laughs> I think you can hit it more than that. 18, uh, played 18 holes, shot a 14. Mike Lennox says, what is or is there a contingency plan for if, in, for if for an instance, a placeholder team wins a top three pick, but for some reason the play-ins get canceled? How could that be awarded? Uh, worst points percentage among those play-ins get that pick? I couldn't imagine you would redo the lottery and screw over everyone else. Um, I don't know that they have that planned out. My guess would be that whatever team would reflect that pick, so like contingency team A, or placeholder team A would be the team with a six percent chance. So that was that would be Montreal. I uh, would imagine a scenario where if the entire season is canceled, that for that one lottery spot, probably either every team in the play in that was going to be in the play in round gets a shot, or every team gets a shot at it. What a mess. Um do, 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 do. yeah i i don't think they would redo the lottery i think that would be a nightmare matt haggard says with steve's news that he is a father what plans have you come up with to turn this child to the light and make sure he grows up as a wings fan oh he's getting a winged wheel podcast onesie um do your does hank have one no do you never ordered one for him no his leg wouldn't even, one of his legs wouldn't even fit yeah, that. Thing. We'd have to get him a, a, a men's small shirt at this point. This guy's already <laughs> built like a brick shit house. Like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> well, he is a brick shit house, probably. Yeah. Oh, we're, lots of poop. Big we're gonna, boy. We're going to show him early the best player to ever wear, number 13, Pavel Datsuk, not Matt Sundin. Joseph Delia says, hey, guys, Brad, I've heard you mention that you've been getting back into hockey cards and my PP moved a little. <laughs> curious what you've been opening i've been opening opg platinum trying to collect mlb line parallel uh parallels um also been buying red wings young guns anyways do any of you guys struggle with anxiety last year i couldn't sleep well the week of the lottery and it's happening again this year it doesn't help that i'm in a i'm a hypochondriac and there's a plague going around jeez i know it's a weird question but curious if you guys have any tips with insomnia or anxiety thanks guys for everything you do when I have to play through a, a, a slow group, that's when my anxiety really spikes up because that's when I just shank a drive. I'll tell you guys, I used to, when the Red Wings were good, I was far more, um, like, I know, like, we, we scream and yell on this podcast sometimes and it seems like we get too worked up about stuff. But if you're talking about, like, I'm not on the podcast and I'm not watching hockey and I'm stressed about it, that kind of went away when the Red Wings started to be bad. Things that actually stress me out are like, I don't know, work, family, the thought of my parents getting old, stuff like that. For anxiety, like if you can't see a professional about it for one reason or another, look into some, I'm not a big natural remedies guy, but I've heard a lot of people say good things about CBD oil, depending on where you live. If the real stuff is legal, that might also help. Um, 
listen to your favorite podcast or maybe don't. I don't know if we stress you out or not. I got some friends who do like, um, not meditation, but like deep breathing exercises before they go to bed and then they wake up like in a totally rested state. So if, if you, I think if you can end one day on a, a good note and clear your mind and wake up the next day fully rested, I think that can kind of snowball and be a positive effect. Who the shit has time for that? <laughs> No, I actually used to teach breathing exercises to my staff at work because they used to have to handle some like... Oh, shit. Patreon exclusive. Breathing exercises. We're going to need it before Friday. If Led everyone shows Evan. in at 7, we'll start <laughs> at 7.30. We'll do the breathing exercises. Hold for five seconds. Okay, I can do that. And... <laughs> Hey, listen, we're already 35 minutes past my bedtime here. We're not wasting time on breathing now. Didn't you? Oh, no, it was Evan's fault. We're, we're starting at nine because he golfed. Uh, you had mentally today, right? Yeah. Well, yesterday I was a 39 on the back, and today I was a 43. It was like I forgot. Oh. What? Sorry, the douche canoe down my street who's got a massive oh, dude. stupid muffler just was went ripping by. My, my neighborhood's an F1 circuit. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I have to stop trying to mute when cars go by. Uh, Lauren T says, hey guys, long time listener, first time patron. I don't have any major technical hockey opinions, but I do have this question. Uh, first of all, thank you, Lauren, for joining the Dub Dub family. Um, what bromances do you think would flourish on the wings? Alessidina and Fileno. Of course, I have to go with Cider and Stutzla, even if that means we would pick lower than first. Also, I promise I would make Ryan speak some German to hopefully get you guys an exclusive interview with Mo Cider. So today's German word is ice hockey, pronounced just like just like in English, ice hockey, but E I S hockey, all one word. Got to start somewhere. Keep up the fab work. Thanks, Lauren. I am officially trilingual. Um, Lafreniere Mantha. Damn it, that was mine. Um, <laughs> hmm. We got to, if we're talking about bromances here, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't somehow include Matthias Brome and anybody because it would be too perfect. Who's the most prominent Swede? Okay, M- Matthias Brome and Anthony Mantha because it's Bromantha. Yeah, well, that's, that's all I'm going with. I, we also I'm have to way talk about too tired to Jersey. think right now. Well, I have to tell uh, Mel that I didn't give the dog dinner. The dog has learned how to trick us into giving her second meals. So we have to stay in constant communication. Um, Cameron Swick says, hey, guys, two things. First, Brad, don't feel bad. I thought it was pronounced Trebucket as well. Hey, look at that. Some validation, Brad. Second, uh, whenever you guys talk about the best jerseys, you always forget about the best one. The Flint Firebirds, Flint Tropics jerseys from the underrated Will Ferrell Classic Semi-Pro. I have yet to score one of these, but it's my number one on my list. Oh, that sounds like a task for Rowan. That is a fint. If you're into Will Ferrell movies, Semi-Pro is awesome. It was so good. It was before he Will Ferrell started getting bad. Well, I don't know. I think he just got tired. Um, by Felicia says, what might be some realistic and not so realistic ways for the Red Wings to prepare for next season? For example, could players go to Europe before the NHL season starts, have an extended development slash training camp, nothing but zoom calls and helping players on an individual level develop. I kind of feel like unique times call for unique solutions. Thanks for being awesome and helping us all through these difficult times. Whatever happens Friday, I'm ready. PS Philip Zadina looks like a beast on his and Philip Hronick's Instagram feeds. Um, players take the ice, but with those big, like six feet circle, uh, it's like us playing bubble soccer. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be on the same ice. We've already done it. We're innovators. There it is. <laughs> bubble soccer, but with, uh, a hole cut out for the stick. Um, what else? I actually would not be surprised to see like the Red Wings, like, or, uh, training development department go like on a one by one place basis to team or players houses to start. Well, it'll they it, can we we won't know what's possible until we know what the covid restrictions are at any given time so there there's a million options but 98% of them probably won't be allowed alex ott says have his, has anyone ever seen brian burke with his tie actually tied around his neck every picture i see uh, him in his tie is undone and just draped around his neck like he just got done informing his mob family of who needs to be whacked next um don't yeah i mean you're probably right anyways if we end up winning the lottery friday i can promise you all the uh that i will be drinking a whole trabucket of ginger ales in celebration stay healthy and safe and also with the first pick in the 2020 nhl draft the detroit red wings select from ramuski we can only hope man eric schrader says no free ads but there's a beer at brewery uh vivant in grand rapids called the tree bucket well we're drinking that 
Nick Putty says, Hey guys, two quick things. First, I work for a company that does outdoor lighting projects and one of our sales reps came to us with none other than the Gordie Howe Bridge that will be built to connect Detroit and Windsor. Unfortunately, the light poles needed are not something we manufacture and the vendor we work with wouldn't be able to quote us on the project. The excitement was about as short-lived as the time we had a 50% chances at first overall. Second thing, I've been playing uh, NHL 20 in both in franchise and career mode. And in both scenarios, Chara has been playing for the Pens. I can't figure out if it's from a trade or free agency signing. Is there any scenario in the real world where you would see that happening? Yeah, he, he needs to be offloaded at the deadline. And Pittsburgh needs to shore up their defense for a cup run. It's actually like not completely unlikely. I think Chara is just too much of a Bruin to maybe do it. I think that Chara will retire before the Bruins get bad again. Um, Joseph Fournier says, Hey there, fellas, and stay fresh cheese bags. Stay cool, stay calm, breathe. Remember not to, oh, I lost my spot here. Remember not to um, heave your large appliances out the window when we inevitably draft fourth and Stevie Y goes off the board. I still stand Osgood for Hall of Fame. Modern goalies are hor- horribly underrepresented, and some of the classic goalies already in there have some god awful numbers. Yeah, Brad, I know it's not supposed to be the Hall of Very Good, but take a look. It already is. Osgood, along with Vernon and Joseph, will each get the call at some point. Anyways, congrats to Aginla, Hosa, Kevin Lowe, Doug Wilson, Landy McDonald, Kim St. Pierre, and through gritted teeth, Kenneth Holland. Thanks for going back uh, to Wednesday. Wow, a lot of comments today. A lot of long ones, too. I hate for that character limit to be put in place because... <laughs> I, I don't even know if that I could do it. I just ask that you guys keep it concise if you can. Um, some of you do, and I appreciate that, but you know, I, I know that sometimes you have a lot to say and that, yeah, that's what overtime is for. All right, guys, this has been our draft lottery preview episode. Again, we are going to be live streaming on Friday, starting at seven Eastern around there. The draft lottery is happening at eight Eastern. So watch along with us, react with us, cry with us. We'd like to thank all of our listeners, our name level sponsors. The septic tank of that bitch, Carol Baskins, Greech, Jeremiah Dobo, Jake Kiefer, by Felicia, Drunky the Dwarf, Brad Smith, uh, Andrew Bohan, Scott Martin, Jacob Turner, Matt McKay, Brandon M., Matthew M. Rice, Luke Johnson, Clayton Van Dyken, Kaylin Wood, Hassam Alkasem, Arjun Shanker, Charlie Elkins, Hannah Lee, Josh Rosnowski, Alex Ott, Chris Frank, Connor Leighton, Danny Jr., Matthew Keeler, Simon Anderson, Antonio Gracias, John Evans, K. Waz, and Stan Olson. We can do this, guys. We'll survive. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.